Good. I'm just going to hold the rest of the panel now and just bring in some people from the audience. So, gentlemen here. Good evening. Um, is green growth not something of an oxymoron? <laughs> Ought we not to be talking more of a green economic shift and ultimately a state of homeostasis rather than a boom and bust green economy? economy? Uh, low carbon, yes, but what about the wider impacts of resources on ecosystems? It can't be business as usual, simply a low carbon version, more of the same will not work. So do you like to see a zero GDP growth world? No. Is that what you're saying? Or that's what you're asking? Can we, de can we decouple the two? Who, who wants to take that question? Dimitri? Well, um, I, I'm not sure you were asking whether you want Sorry, a, no, a zero GDP you. growth world, but, but, but certainly um, any attempt to decouple has got to acknowledge that the world has got to grow, in particular developing countries, the only route out of poverty uh, is to grow. So growth has got to be part of the story. The question is how do you do that with less and less resource use? Uh, and that depends on using resources smarter. So effectively, it's about innovation, it's about technologies, it's about processes. The good news is that that transformation has already begun, but once again, that innovation and that transformation won't happen in a vacuum. It will happen if governments ask for it. Uh, entrepreneurs will develop the technologies that allow you to decouple. It ain't that difficult. Technologists will tell you that it can be done pretty quickly. Um, the barriers aren't technological, they're not economic. They are institutional, they're cultural, they're political. Can I take a shot at that as well? Yeah. So I, I think it's, it's important to understand that you know, the history of economic growth shows that economic growth is driven by technology innovation in the end. So long-term economic growth has not been driven by you know, using a lot of resources. You know, it's, been, it's been driven by doing more with the resources you have. And in a way, our resource intense intensive way of growing is almost more of a byproduct exactly. than it is a driver of how we grow. Exactly. So to, to decouple our growth from our, for, from our resource intensity shouldn't mean that we stop growing at all, in fact. You know, exactly. Most of the growth comes from very different areas, and it's just shifting the model. Um, and in fact, the problem is we all know that in the long run, it's better for growth because we're going to run out of resources, right? Yes. It's, a limited, it's a limited factor of production, as they say. So in the very long run, the only way to grow is to grow greenly. What we don't know is when exactly that turning point happens. You know, nowadays, because of climate change, the turning point seems to be needing to happen much more quickly, quickly than we ever thought. But, you know, so, so there's no contradiction, um, in my opinion. Well, resource prices are already shooting up because demand is exceeding supply, even though a third of the world is in recession, by the way. So it is happening. Yes, um, commodity, yeah, absolutely, commodity. Uh, did that give you something of the answer you wanted? I hope. Yes. yes. Um, next question. Sorry, I don't know who's got the microphone now. Great, over there. Um, you've been saying that Europe is not one entity like the US or China, that countries in Europe are different. So should we, in fact, just abandon the European project and just let every European country do what they can? And actually, should that question be, is the UK falling behind other world leaders in green growth rather than Europe, seeing as it's not unified. It's quite interesting, actually, if you look at Norway and how well Norway has done on green issues on its own. Um, who would like to take that question? I'll jump in. Yeah? I think, I, think, I think, first of all, we shouldn't abandon the Europe project because no matter how you're going to look at it, this requires collective action. And when you cut through it, with the exception of Norway, there's really no country in Europe that can be energy self-sufficient, and so, certainly no one can be low-carbon self-sufficient. This is a collective issue that requires a collective solution. This is actually one of the problems even driving in the United States, where you don't have a collective solution because you've got about 15 states really wanting renewables and another 15 saying no way, and everyone else in the middle, it is a collection. And that's one of the reasons the United States is not growing, because the federal government has not taken a collective action. And if you really, you know, climate change, carbon doesn't respect borders, energy doesn't respect borders. I actually think we need more integration on this because I think you have to look at energy security and climate security and low carbon security, much as we looked at security during the Cold War, it needs to be a collective mechanism. James? Could, could I, I, I wonder if you'll indulge me if I, I wanted to talk about carbon capture and storage at some point this evening, and I might try to do that in the context of your question. On, if you on, can make on, a, pr a, a really <laughs> credible link. Well, it does. It is relevant. It is relevant. If I stretch it a little bit. Um, I mean, so first of all, people may react and say, hang on a minute, you're talking about CCS, which, per, which uh, perpetuates fossil fuels, and we're supposed to be here talking about green growth, so is CCS green? We can have a discussion about that. Uh, but it goes back to the opening uh, 
comments that I had that Europe's strong on big statements and strong on plans, but very poor on delivery, nowhere more so than in carbon capture and storage, where the NER 300, if that means anything to anyone, has failed dismally, and there now seems to be a problem of integration between what Europe's trying to do and individual countries in Europe are trying to do, and yet without CCS, we don't fix climate change because coal and gas, as has been said, are strongly inframarginal. They will get burnt. Mm. And unless we capture the carbon, we will fry the planet. And worse than that, we're beyond the point of no return already, so we'll need carbon, negative carbon technologies, and CCS is the prime negative carbon technology. So to anyone who whispers that it might not work, well, it's been running in the United States for the last 40 years in some cases. Um, so again, the US accounts for, I think, seven of the eight operating plants, and of the eight that are under construction, the US is seven of those as well, and Europe, despite a great deal of discussion, has failed to do it. But coming to your point about should we just get on with it ourselves, I think the UK does deserve some credit. I've already said the energy bill, and on CCS, although there was a misstart in the UK. Uh, the UK government is getting on with that as well. There's some work being done on Norway too. So I think in order to solve our European problem, it's almost a bit like the United States. It doesn't happen at federal level. It starts from individual states doing it and eventually the federal side has to come in and integrate it. So the individual countries in Europe should stay the course, but they should do their stuff and promote a wider collaboration on the basis of what they themselves are doing. Nowhere more so in my opinion than with CCS. Torland. Just a quick comment on this one. I think one of the reasons why Europe has such a difficult time to deliver is that, of course, the European countries are very different. I mean, just like take carbon emissions and, and the power generating capacity. You have places like Norway where approximately 95, 97% of all the power comes from hydro. That makes it relatively easy to manage the carbon footprint of your power generating industry. And then you have places like Poland, where approximately 90, 95% of your power comes from coal-fired power plants. You obviously have very different existing asset structures, and as a result of this, the interests of the individual countries and their stakeholders in the respective political process are very different. But from my perspective, this simply means it's going to be very hard to pick and choose technologies and micromanage this transition on a European level because you have all these different perfectly legitimate vested interests in this. The only way to get there is to, sell, to set some kind of framework and be it a floor carbon price of X for all European countries, once agreed not to be challenged anymore. That I think is a way to stimulate really the transition. If we try to, if governments try to micromanage these transitions, I, I'm afraid the complexity of the issues are gonna get everybody bogged down and nothing, nothing is actually gonna happen. Can I add one thing on that, yep. just about the complexity on Europe? Uh, Philip Lowe, who runs the energy, he's the senior civil servant in, in Brussels, talks about it, when you think about it, there are 10 or 12 companies in Europe that supply 80% of the gas and electricity consumed in Europe. They have to deal with the EU and 27 different regulators depending on their market. And that's the reality. Does, that make any sense? This is why it cries out for a common solution, because that's the reality of this market structure. Right. Very interesting. Question down here. Yeah, my, my question is actually about public opinion and public acceptability on whether that is potentially a break in Europe on the supply side to let us move forward. James has mentioned difficulties with energy efficiency, whether we might not get a kind of consumer-led boom. But Europe you know, has a very mature sort of settlement structures. It's a congested continent. Germany, for example, has renounced nuclear power, it's renounced CCS. There are difficulties with, with wind investment in the UK. Is it possible that we will prevent ourselves moving forward with the infrastructure we need? Because frankly, we don't have the public consent to do it. Any views? I think it's possible, but I think it's more of a lack of political leadership, to be honest, because the public just, you know, it's communication and education. You know, in each country is a little bit different, but I think, it's, I think it's a lack of political leadership. I mean, I would like to know more about how people think the media can frame these issues, because it's been very difficult in the last three years. The, the media has gone really silent on this stuff, and as somebody who used to write about environment quite often, um, it has become just much more difficult. And one of the reasons it's become more difficult is because it sounds like the same old story. 
I mean, editors don't really want to run the same old story. So if anyone's got any views on, you know, how we should frame this thing differently to move forward, that would be very useful. Well, I could have a stab at that if you like. Yeah. I, I mean, it's really the interaction between different parties in, in bringing forth a common understanding and a, you know, a, a common dialogue is vitally important. Um, there, are, there are real thresholds and critical masses. Once, um, it doesn't matter who starts displaying leadership. Once leadership is displayed either from government or from businesses, consumers will then follow because they'll understand that there, is, you know, there are profits to be made, there are jobs to be created. Businesses will follow if governments show leadership on the policy framework. Governments will follow if businesses say, look, uh, we've got private money, we want to invest in this, if you give us a credible policy framework. So there's a real critical mass which can be either very advantageous and virtuous or very vicious. At the moment, we're stuck in a sort of vicious trap where everybody's waiting for everybody else to move and everyone's being defensive. It's understandable in the current environment. Unfortunately, it's self-defeating. Uh, and those countries that have made a success of it, and you see countries and indeed cities that have made a success of it, have done so because if you go to a Scandinavian city um, and, and you ask a policymaker why are you doing so much on sort of the environment and renewables, I well, because we're held accountable for it. Our, our electorate expects us to do that. We've made a success of it. Um, they demand that we do that. Um, why? What do you guys do? Uh, so they're in that virtuous. You can either take a sort of a vicious or a, or a you know, resource-intensive path or a low resource intensity path, where you end up doesn't make any difference to your growth or income levels. In fact, you know, you could, some of the richest countries in Europe are the ones that have actually been most active in this field, but it does make a difference to how resource intensive you are and uh, how your civil society relationship through the press, business, and government interact in trying to bring about goals uh, that are long-term rather than short-term driven. Good. Briefly, do you guys, I mean, in answer to the question, I mean, do you think that public consent will be a constraint on Yes, I do. I think it would be a very significant constraint. And by the way, there's an extraordinary irony, isn't there, that Germany bans nuclear and ends up uh, negating the American emission reduction by displacing coal, because Germany's now burning the coal that America would other otherwise have, have burned. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a small village called Barendrecht, which is about 14 kilometers from Shell's major refinery in Rotterdam, where Shell hoped to do a carbon capture and storage project and ultimately had to withdraw because of uh, public um, opposition. Um, and Shell, as, as quite often is the case, didn't make a perfect job of the communications. Uh, but I think it, even if it had done better, uh, the outcome would have been the same. Um, so we are a crowded continent in Western Europe. There are some implications of that. Sadly, onshore wind won't be as prevalent as it ought to be. I think it also means that CCS will go offshore and be more expensive as a result. It doesn't mean all is lost, though, um, because, Jim, you'll know probably better than I do that if you do the sums and we set the policies right and we do the R&D and we do the option management properly and we do go through the demo phase properly and we don't make preemptive decisions about what works and what doesn't, it is still doable in an affordable way, about 1% or so of GDP, at least for the UK, according to the ESME model, which, by the way, has the effect of deferring economic growth by one year. So the goods and services we thought we would get in 2050, we'll get in 2051. So this is eminently doable. I think we do have to accept it's a crowded space, and therefore some of the th we will be barging liquid CO2 down the Rhine to take to Rotterdam. We'll be putting the CO2 <laughs> along with the Indian CO2 into tanks in Rotterdam, and we'll be taking it uh, offshore and burying it in the North Sea. That's the absurd reality of it, but on, on the other side, it also probably means that to the extent geologically there's shale gas potential in Europe, it will be realized much more slowly and to a lesser degree than it has been in the United States. Okay, thank you, James. I've got quite a few. Do you want to have a very one, brief... One last thing. I, mean, I, think it's, I think it's a fair choice for a consumer to make that he doesn't want a windmill in his backyard. I mean, if he wants to pay more and have it offshore, it's everyone's right to do that. I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with that. Everyone consumes, and consuming a landscape is just like consuming energy in a sense. But um, I think my bigger concern about the, these kind of roadblocks to making progress is that we're simply in a world where we don't have time anymore. I mean, if you believe the science at all, it's getting worse and worse, right? The dangers and risks are getting, are faster than we ever expected. You know, so anyone who's a denier of climate change, or at least a denier of the risk of climate change, I mean, you really have to wake up. I mean, every indicator of risk is, so we're really, we're running out of time. And the risk now is that we have to do this transition at such a short 
pace. It's such, it's such short notice. It's such a rapid pace that it costs much, much more because we didn't take the time to do it uh, you know, gradually, to develop the technologies in time. And then all of a sudden, we're paying. You know, it's not just a 1% increment because we've waited so long. It becomes a huge cost uh, in 10 years, and we have to do it much quicker. You know, or, or we pay the price. Um, you know, but I think that's the risk of these kind of, this kind of short-termism of, of you know, not in my backyard. Um, um, there's a lot of questions. There's a person at the back who's been waiting for ages. Would you like to come in? Uh, hi there, I'm Biff, and I study at Forum for the Future. Um, my question is about energy efficiency, because it seems like a really easy win. Um, DEC recently launched its um, energy efficiency strategy, and it's quite light on clear policy intervention. And I just wondered what you thought the, the clear policy intervention of government could be to incentivize business, especially the, the non-domestic sector, to invest in energy efficiency. Any ideas? Well, I think energy efficiency plays an incredibly important role in this entire equation. And, and I, I think depending on the country you're looking at, I mean, there are incentives in place to really reduce energy consumption when I mean, it's obviously geographically vastly different depending on if you look at different countries like the US, Germany, and Saudi Arabia, I mean, they, of course, they all have their own particular environment they, they have to deal with. But at the end of the day, I think we need to put things into perspective. If we look into the last Shell Energy report, it spells out the challenge very clearly. I mean, at the end of the day, we have to, the world has to provide a whole lot more energy to a growing population with high expectations as far as life standards, living standards is concerned. And we can factor in innovation, energy efficiency, but at the end of the day, by 2050, we have to produce an additional, or we have to produce additional energy equivalent to the entire size of the energy industry by year 2000. And then you have the additional complications, so to speak, that a lot of this additional energy has to come with a much smaller carbon footprint. And in this whole equation, it's already assumed the total increase in energy demand is reduced by 20% through energy efficiency, and perhaps there's more in there. So energy efficiency is incredibly important. It's a big part of the equation, but it's not going to solve the underlying challenge. Tom, briefly, and then I'll I think, bring somebody else in. I think there, there are two things you can do, and actually one is price and the other is nothing. The best, the best thing for energy efficiency is price. In the United States, gasoline went from $2.50 a gallon to $4 a gallon. People stopped buying big SUVs because they couldn't afford to fill the tank. You know, electricity price goes up, people use less. Price is the best way to get it into it. The second part is about nothing, particularly in the industrial side. This is organic, it happens anyway. And this is partially around price. When, you know, a factory comes to replace a motor or a compressor, you know, from one that's 20 years ago, the new one is more efficient. Think about the refrigerator that you have today. It probably uses a tenth of the electricity to cool as one from 20 years ago. And there's an organic change that goes on here. And the only other driver then is government regulation mandating more efficient use of the equipment. But the thing is, it happens, so the part is nothing, or if you want it to go faster, it's price, but price, you know, scares a lot of people. Can I, can I add a little? I mean, I'm, I'm an economist, so I, I, I love, you know, I'm naturally uh, inclined towards the price mechanism for changing behavior. And I think the you know, uh, pricing resources effectively is the single most important uh, policy element in this equation. However, when it comes to energy efficiency, I think there is something to be said for non-price mechanisms, partly because almost by definition, if you are wasting energy, you are not responding very rationally to price signals, right? Um, so standards and regulations may be a good approach. I mean, you mentioned fridges. I don't know about you, but when I go and buy a fridge, um, I tend to either look at the one that looks best and costs least in terms of, you know, I don't bring my tables and work out the payback period on the energy efficiency. and what. I'd much rather, frankly, and it would save me a lot of time if government just mandated that I have to buy the fridge that's going to save me money, even if it costs a little bit more, rather than, you know, me wasting my life, which is frankly short. They've they effectively yeah. done that, though. No, that's right. I'm saying there is a role for that yeah. as well. It's an on-price. I oh, know, I'm agreeing. Pricing yeah. Is, yeah. is essential, and it's a prerequisite. Uh, it's necessary, but it's not a sufficient uh, policy condition for energy efficiency. The problem is when people buy bigger and bigger fridges, because they seem to need more and more food. Well, anyway, that's, that's where the, the price is very important, because it staunches <laughs> exactly. what they call the rebound effect. Exactly. So you need both. Gentlemen down here. Yes, please. 
Um, the panel have talked about the level of investment that's needed over the next decade or two in both infrastructure and energy generating capacity. Um, and my understanding is that that's, you know, dwarfs the sort of investment that we've seen in the three decades since privatization. So my question for the panel is, really, can we achieve what we're looking to achieve through complicated policy incentives looking to encourage the private sector to do, do what we need them to do, or do we need some more active centralized planning? So in the UK, do we need a CEGV again? Right. I, I used to say bring back the CEGB and I got hissed down whenever I said it. Um, and, and I don't know that you'd want to bring, down this, bring, bring, bring back the CEGB as an owner operator. You could bring back the concept as uh, a sort of strategic buyer or a planner and uh, an integrator and operator of the network. And to some degree, that's the sort of thing that's being done in the, in the energy bill at the moment. And, and it is complicated. Um, but I, I wouldn't lose faith in the market. If we can distinguish in our minds properly among those things of R&D, the demonstration phase, and then leaving it to the market, then I think this thing is doable. Um, and th there's, the whole thing has become more so complicated, and there's so much special pleading going on yeah. that it makes it hard to distinguish that which is policy and that which is special pleading. So if we could look through and concentrate on the policy, I think it's doable. So you do need that price signal from demand for power, but also the implications of uh, carbon emission in order to make the market work effectively long term. You're still left with the 110 billion or the 200 billion pounds worth of investment, which actually, although Dimitri's right, there's a huge amount of, um, well, uh, 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 unused capacity in the economy that could be brought to bear. The equity base of the companies that have to do it isn't large enough in all probability, although the funding, if you could establish the equity base, probably is large enough, so some mechanisms are required in order to enhance the equity base of some of the potential investors, and there are some folks who've had some quite clever ideas about how you and I can act to take on some of that equity risk as customers in order to broaden the equity base and let the, the debt funding and mezzanine funding come in. Thank you. We're going to have to wrap up for drinks in a minute. There's one more question over there. So does anybody quickly want to just address this gentleman first? Yeah, I was gonna, yeah so uh, on, the, on the market, I just think as a general principle, one place where Europe is at risk of falling behind and where it could certainly do better is smart use of the market. So I'm very much in favor of market mechanisms, but sometimes we really, we just lose it. We, we think this, there's this universal principle that the market always has to be the answer to every element of the policy as opposed to, you know, as opposed to using the market smartly, I mean, you know, it goes to this energy efficiency question, for instance. I, I don't want to talk about any specific policies, but when the outcome you want is so clear, to put in a very difficult and convoluted mechanism for financing individual homes to purchase energy efficiency equipment. But you I mean, don't want to talk about any specific no, policies. But that, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, just, it just says it's not a good use of the market. I mean, it doesn't mobilize the market to do something more effectively than you could have done it otherwise. And, and I think there are other countries that are starting to think about using markets better. They come from a tradition that's not as market driven and they're now seeing markets as ways to do things better. And you see it in Brazil and the way it's been trying to um, uh, purchase renewable energy and I think you're seeing it in China. And, and they're actually in a way going to use the market smarter than we do. And, and I think that's a missed opportunity and we could easily fall behind. Camilla, you'll hate me, but at risk of... Just, I just think there's one element that we have missed on, on making... The, you're absolutely right, making the market work appropriately through clear, transparent pricing, non-interventionalist uh, market-based methods is uh, the best way to avoid policy failures and special pleading and vested interest. But um, there was something you mentioned before about Spain's retroactive uh, policies that we haven't talked about, and that is the fact that we live in an uncertain world, both in terms of you know, how climate change and resource depletion is going to play out, but also how the technologies are going to uh, evolve. And that means that policy has to be designed very, very uh, intelligently to deal with this conflict, because businesses want certainty. They want a clear, credible uh, signal. But you know that you know, the world is changing. How do you do that without scaring business off by kind of retroactively changing your policy when the world uh, starts doing things you didn't expect? And I would take a cue out of monetary policy here. Uh, we know um, the central bank and the markets know that the macroeconomic environment will change and that therefore interest rates will have to change. But what they want is a very clear, transparent reaction function, which they understand, uh, for the bank to make its decisions. So that when interest rates do change, 
investors are not spooked by surprises because they say, yeah, we understand why rates have changed because the real world has come in like this. And you want exactly the same process for climate policy. You want an open, transparent process of review that says, we're going to put a price for you here, but in two years' time, this is how we're going to review it, this is how we're going to look back, and this is the process by which we might change that. And businesses, I think, will take that. Businesses don't like risks they don't control, and it does require the public sector taking on policy risks that it does control. So some skin in the game through things like a green investment bank that tell the private sector that, you know what, if the policy changes retroactively and unexpectedly, we stand to lose money as well as you. It's perhaps the clearest and most credible and convincing message that you can give businesses uh, to persuade them to invest their capital, especially in this environment where they've got lots of it, but they're incredibly nervous. Brilliant. Um, last question, and then we, we'll, we'll go and have a drink. Yeah, thank, uh, th thank you very much for a very interesting debate. I I've been a little bit disappointed this evening at the lack of focus on energy efficiency and in, even broader than that, resource efficiency. Um, and I think this is probably somewhere where the journalists can find some really interesting and perhaps even sexy stories. But um, businesses really are, and maybe some of these world-leading organisations around green growth are really now looking more and more at resource efficiency, not mm. just in their own operations, but throughout the supply chain. And we've seen some really uh, impressive moves by certain sectors. Uh, take one example is the, is the auto, automotive sector where we've seen quite significant step, steps forward in performance, in, in weight saving and energy efficiency. And when you consider that every business out there wastes 30% of its energy and the return on investment of energy efficiency is dramatically higher than the return on investment on any renewables, even with in tariffs and renewable heat, I'm surprised that that isn't seen as, as a great way for uh, keeping Europe ahead in the green growth and uh, s separating out the winners from the potential future losers. Thank you. Um, quick comment for everybody on whether businesses are, are taking that seriously, and if not, why not? If, if I may, John, uh, I, I think it's useful to distinguish demand management from energy efficiency, and I know that you do, um, and, and I agree probably regulation rather than price is a better way to achieve uh, efficiency of the various means by which we consume energy, whether it be a vehicle, vehicle or a TV or a house or whatever else it might be. So putting in regulation to demand more efficiency is, has been demonstrated to be a very effective thing. I think we're back to the Jevons paradox, which you know about, which is that if you can find a way of doing something more efficiently, you don't use less, less of it, you use more of it. Uh, and he was talking about coal, the modern day version, I quote, is if we only we could invent a, a more efficient patio heater, we'd be able to heat an awful lot more patios. Or more efficient lights, we'll be able to light up our gardens and our parks and our forests. Because the problem is, I won't accuse you of being the problem, the problem's me, I want more. I've been programmed to want more, and all of my behavior seems to indicate that I want more. So if you can find a way of me doing it more efficiently, then I'll take more of it. And, and one of the problems, I think, with uh, domestic heat is that you can make the building more efficient through various mechanisms, good or bad, but I'll still want my thermal comfort, and my thermal comfort will be de dependent on my disposable income rather than the... So I'll, I'll have my T-shirt on and the temperature at 24 degrees when you improve the insulation of my house. And I'm yeah, not that's, sure that's I'll back be curbed. To the, um, communication education point. Jason, do you want to say a quick price. Price. That's and the, the need for a product. Any, any, Jason, quick word on that? Or? No, I, no, I really agree. I mean, I think, I think resource productivity is the heart of green growth. And if we didn't emphasize it, I think it was just because it was so implicit in what we're doing. And, and you know, I do agree with, with you, James. But, you know, I, I don't know that the kickback effect is quite as big as, as some theorists say it is. And, you know, I, I don't, yeah, anyway, I completely agree. I think energy efficiency and resource productivity has to be the first priority. I think it's the heart of green growth. I think that and technology innovation are my two sort of core elements of what a green growth pathway has to look like. Thank uh, you. Yeah. Torland? Well, I, I said it earlier, energy efficiency will play an incredibly important role. It's very relevant for Europe, but it's not going to solve the global energy challenge because in Europe we can gain a lot from energy efficiency. In other parts of the world where we're developing and see rapid economic growth, energy efficiency is still relevant, but will not solve the underlying challenge of providing more energy. But I wholeheartedly support the concept of resource efficiency. We are clearly living on a planet which becomes more and more resource constrained in, in different corners of different markets. And to tap natural resources in a more efficient manner will be absolutely critical for future wealth creation and growth. Thank you. Dimitri? 
I do think what's really important is that policy is integrated and coherent. So it really isn't just about pushing CCS there and leaving everything else or, or just putting a price on and forgetting regular. The sum is much greater than the parts when it comes to uh, this kind of policy. And if you take an example of a city, yeah, great, you can have electric vehicles that plug in, but if they plug into a coal-fired grid and you're building a sprawling city without public transport, with, uh, you know, uh, without the requisite density of urban planning, and so on and so forth, um, you're not going to make much of a dent in terms of resource efficiency. Everything's got to play uh, an integrated part if it's going to be successful. And that, of course, makes the communication a bit more complicated again. But it is a fact of life, unfortunately. Thank you. Tom? I think it's been said. Terrific. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. And um, let's have another show of hands on the question, although some people have left. But um, is Europe falling behind other world leaders in green growth? How many people uh, still agree with that? Pretty similar to what it was before. <laughs> Thank you very much.